So here we are to the integral chat on Sunday 28th today, I guess, 28th of April. Yeah. And the topic is open. We, so far we have done all the first and second tier levels of development. And then we have talked about how to handle these stages of, of development and go back and forth from one to the other. And today, what you want to do? Uh, I know, Natalie, you wanted to spec speculate on third tier, <laughs> if, if you want to do that, I don't know. Uh, otherwise, we can talk about states, but I think states would be nicer when also, uh, hi, Jeremy, when um, uh, Karen is here, who won't be here today, so. Mm -hmm. Open space. What would you like to uh, to discuss today? Let's let's collect it. Uh, what you what is on your mind? Just spontaneous coming up now. As a check in, let's say. Um, well, I'm sorry I missed the conversation on third tier last week. I haven't been able to watch the video, and I'm sad about that. It seems very um, very interesting. Like you guys had a lot of fun. Um, yeah, but it was not really third tier. It was how to, to go back and forth in first and second tier, how we can handle that. It was not about third tier. <laughs> oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm interested in um, some of those later stages, third tier, that includes a lot of the spiritual elements, though, the states. So I'm wondering if maybe talking about third tier would, uh, uh, a time for that would be after talking about states so that we have a clear understanding of some of that base um, language and vocabulary as we talk about the transpersonal stages. Um, so and today, other thoughts are lines of development is something that I've been interested in. Oh, I have okay. not mm -hmm. explored with anybody in the integral community more than just a mention. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. How about anybody else? Um, I'm good to talk about anything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a suggestion what anything could be for you? <laughs> um, yeah, what with, like with, uh, Natalie was suggesting, suggesting like um, lines or, or third tier, I don't. Yeah, I don't really care. Whatever people want. I can jump in. I, as, as Jeremy is here, I would be interested more in the difference between um, uh, the Gebser integral and the Wilbur integral, because I listened a little bit to what you have said, but it's not that I understood everything on, on the one recording I have from you. I think with, with a Mark, like, uh, yeah, with mm -hmm. Tom and Mark. Uh, that's what I would love to. Then we have still Kate and Paul to ask, and also Jeremy himself. <laughs> well, I'm I, I'd be happy to talk about that anytime. Sorry. Yeah, I'm open to anything. I just I'm sort of interested in lines of development and how how certain state. I mean, I haven't read Kohlberg, and you know, if anybody has any ideas about how moral development occurs or ethical development, particularly through the stages. But I, I don't care to talk about anything. Um, I feel like I'm a bit of a vegetable today, like kind of bored of like everything. So it's kind of hard for me to like rally. I'm just in kind of one of those moods. Um, but that said, lines kind of lines kind of grab me. Um, I've spoken to a few people a few times about lines and sort of how complex it gets. So um, uh, yeah, that that one gets my vote. Okay, so maybe we can do lines or even the moral line and compare that then in the different systems. And Jeremy, you you tell us how it is in, in the system of gaps. I'm interested in the moral line of development because, or in morality or ethic uh, altogether, because it seems to me that, that nowadays you are sort of very insecure. <laughs> 
how to treat each other and how to be in the world in this um, respect. So I would like to do that. Yeah, actually, that's a topic that's at hand for me this morning. One of the reasons why I was up so late last night. So um, I've got some skin in the game today. Okay, are we there, everybody? Yeah, great. Yep. Okay, so I would say as it is so near to you, Natalie, do you want to tell us what, what it is about? And maybe we start from there and see what, where we go. Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, so lines is not something that I've really studied much at all. Um, a lot of what I'd be sharing and exploring is stuff that I'm just like wondering and making up to, to start with. So if anybody has more experience with exploring that, um, I really invite you to jump in. I mean, what you said while you woke up the whole night or what you were uh, uh, engaged yeah. the whole night. Can you give us this as an, uh, sure. an example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, something that I've been um, exploring uh, partially in the context of my life, but also with Zen and Buddhist practice is um, having a, um, an anchor value that when um, I feel confused about how to navigate a conflict, um, that anchor value can help me make a choice about how to move forward in a way that is supportive for everybody present. And definitely stages comes into mind as a way to understand people's values, but then um, choosing the way that I, I step in um, is uh, like having, having a default value is something that I'm, I'm Kind of grappling with and interested in and i've um, been engaging with it by looking at the context of my life like when i was growing up with my parents um, how is it that i i navigated some of those early childhood problems and what is what is my default value and for me um, it seems to be love and receptivity those are some of my innate things um, a little side note, this reminds me of uh, Adya Shanti's new book, The Most Important Thing, and some other teachings that I've heard from other um, spiritual teachers that have that like grounding principle. And um, Adya Shanti introduces it by um, asking us to similarly um, look for what is our natural, um, like our natural organizing principle our natural um, default value there. Um, and the last thought that I'll uh, throw in the pot is how that natural value often includes a lot of shadow. It's a way that we've navigated conflict and chosen what to suppress and what to embody, um, often unconsciously through childhood, and so bringing it into consciousness now and adulthood, um, and recognizing the um, the the inner experiences and the expressions and the, the things that are lost from choosing that value um, is is what I'm really curious about. So. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Now, can I ask you what, what actually happened? You have now given mm -hmm. sort of the description around, the, the theory around. What, what was the, the occasion which has aroused this, uh, these thoughts? Sure. If you want to share. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I was refraining from getting a little bit too personal because I want to really respect um, the other people that are involved. Yeah, it's clear. So you don't speak have a little bit to... slowly around this. <laughs> You to, don't to have to say names, that. you know, but I, what uh, my intention is with these uh, conversations is to bring it a little bit more down in, into our experience, into, into real life examples, you know. You can invent names, whatever you want, you know, uh, or, but, but just that I, I can get an idea why you would be uh, awake the whole night. That must be something which has really, you know, got you. So uh, if, if you can share that. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Hmm. 
So what has me awake is recognizing how through my life uh, I've chosen love and to support and feel empathy for people in my life and chosen to not express negativity unless it feels important to set a boundary and like really important for for my happiness and and health and Sometimes when I share that with people, um, it's met with judgment, um, especially in the psychology community um, and some other relationships, because then people feel like I'm not expressing all of myself, like I'm not expressing my emotional experience. And um, they want to feel more of me. And my inner process is, if I, if I share more of me, then I may hurt the other person. Um, and so my, it, it rubs up against that moral value of wanting to create more good and more connection and more positivity rather than naming the things that are, um, that are painful and thereby weakening the connection and the relationship. Um, often, uh, I have a, a rather high threshold for things that I can handle. I can handle things on my own internally and process them pretty well on my own. Um, and for some people that's judged as I'm suppressing things. And so it rubs up against like my value for honesty and transparency also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I have kind of a real life example as well. It's a community I've been involved in for many years, spiritual community. And you know, as for the norm these days, uh, Buddhist teachers that have gotten into trouble for abusive behaviors, and not just sexual, but physical abusive behaviors. And um, so, you know, seeing that possibly they had achieved certain states of awareness, uh, spiritual line of development, and it seems like some of the, well, I guess there's also the psychosexual line, right? The, what does Ken call it? The social, some, some line. But it seems like it kind of stuck in the power red meme, you know, with some people. There's a lot of shadow manifestations. And, you know, ethics are kind of, and ethics, ethics and morals are kind of thrown off. And this is considered to be working with your ego when this stuff happens. Or, you know, there's some kind of like whitewash kind of put on it. That, you know, crazy wisdom, they call it. And so just kind of wondering how that moral development, what inspire, what encourages that or an ethical development? I think this is a, a deep conversation that it takes some time to um, really organize how we feel and when what direction that we want to take some of these deep questions. Yeah. I have in mind when I listened to Jordan Peterson about the uh, moral development that he says it's, uh, it, it develops automatically in, in childhood when you even this, this, uh, with animals in, in play, in play situations that you figure out how, how to play how to win, but not only once, how to behave so that people, uh, other people or other animals, what the group is, invite you again to play. And so you, uh, it sort of, if you are intelligent enough, intelligent in a certain way, you figure out how to be in your social environment in the, in the best way. And this is automatically sort of in a fair way, respect the other and uh, 
be com competitive, but only up to a certain point, you know, and, and let the other be and so on. And it sort of convinced me because I saw that uh, with animals uh, around that they would never do what, what humans do to each other, you know, by a misguided moral development, which uh, often was, in my opinion, corrupted by, by authorities, let's say, you know? so. And then I see often in people who are in, in, um, still in purple, I don't know, Ryan, is, is if, if that is also your experience, they have a different way of, 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 of treating people with more, uh, not as cruel, not as, as we know it from the red stage, no, not as, uh, but they, they are sort of in the community in a sort of respect, I don't know if you can call that respect, but consideration, they feel that they are part of it, of, 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 of the group, and, and they wouldn't do that to, to me, you uh, know, or to the other people. I see it here, I, I have some people around which are, in my opinion, still in, 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 in purple, and it's just a different thing when an, an, a red person arrives, you know, it's, it's a different, a different feeling and they, I can give them the key of my house without any thought, you know, that's, I, I know they wouldn't uh, do anything strange, you know, maybe some things they don't know and make some errors, that yes, but they would never be, do something in their own, you know, ecocentric something because they don't have it, so. Uh, excuse me, um, that, that resonates too. I feel like uh, in purple, the, the moral development, there's a lot of respect with that hierarchy, the respect of the elders, and it's like the, a natural hierarchy of age and wisdom that falls into place. Um, and what may be lacking in purple is sometimes an emotional development. And um, however, that, that evaluation comes from uh, some of the people that are in purple in my life haven't uh, really looked at how true it is for people in general that I don't know directly. Um, the other thing that stood about what you shared, Heidi, is how moral development in humans is uh, really affected from our social structure, from external influences, and um, how that can really cause things to become twisted in different ways, whether it's beautiful or um, brutal. Basically, how those interjections happen of moral development and shape and change what our natural tendency might be. Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> just to go back to what you were saying, Heidi. I have the same experience in Hawaii, and it's it, it makes things a little complicated. I've been having a lot of discussions with people about this, in that technically a red is higher than purple but people at purple tend to be more ethical than a, a higher stage. So how does that fit into the equation? And I was talking to several people about this, about how, um, you know, I, I think my intellectual line of development is probably at Teal. And the great Isaac Newton, the legendary physicist and, you know, guy who invented calculus and found out gravity and all that stuff, his intellectual line of development is probably at orange. So we both have access to orange thinking, but his orange is a hell of a lot better than mine. Right, his IQ is a heck of a lot higher than mine. And I was talking to a lot of people about this, about how to depict that in the integral system. Because if, if on first glance, if someone said, Ryan's intellectual, Ryan's cognitive line development is higher than Newton, people would be like, are you kidding me? Um, so as I like to say, if you're gonna hire someone to be your math tutor, and you saw my integral cycle graph and Newton's integral cycle graph, and you didn't know it was me or him, who would you choose to, to have as your math tutor? Probably me, because mine is higher. So that's not really like, the, I think it can become kind of complicated too. And if you want to think about ethical development, you can have three people who are all at the same stage, roughly. I'd say three people at blue or amber, ethnocentric. But one of the guys could be a complete jerk and the other guy could be a saint. But they could, they're all still ethnocentric. So my idea was um, how to better depict this horizontal difference, you can just have another line that goes sideways. So if we have cognitive development, I may be at 
teal and Newton may be at orange. So we both have access to orange, but Newton's orange goes all the way this way and mine is like just about over here. So I think it, I'm, one of my problems is that if I'm explaining integral theory to people who don't know about integral theory, and to, to beginners and I'm trying to explain lines of development, I need to tell them that so they don't think that I think that I'm smarter than Newton, right? And so um, the same thing with moral development too is that you can have people at the same stage and some people are still more ethical than others even though they're all at red or they're all at orange or green. Um, so I think that, yeah, one, one analogy that someone gave was like a skyscraper. And so you can have a higher state, a higher floor and have a larger view of town from a higher floor of the um, skyscraper. But if someone has a room that's one level below or several levels below, you can still have a cleaner and bigger room. So Newton's room on the cognitive line was lower than mine. This is, this is someone I talked to who, who made up this analogy. But his cognitive floor was a heck of a lot. His room was bigger than my room. I could be living in a tiny house, but a teal. And he was living in a mansion at Orange. So these are just other metaphors to, to clear up some uh, confusion, I think, about lines of development. I'm wondering, Jeremy, I have understood that in GAPSA there are no levels of development in the sense as it is in, in Ken Wilber. So how would that be handled there? Yeah, so it's really a different question um, because Gebser was not a psychologist. He was not trying to study he wasn't working within the framework or, or milieu of developmental psychology. So his questions and inquiries and his approach and methodology were completely different. So in many ways, this is not really something that he's like the structures of consciousness aren't really looking at this. They're not going, okay, Newton versus Ryan. Um, so I, I don't really know. Um, I, I don't think it really applies. It's just, it's not, it's not looking at those things. It's looking more at um, uh, uh, discontinuous transformations in cultural phenomenology. So those are more neutral in terms of what's higher and lower, and they're more looking at um, more phenomenological questions. How do we orient towards space and time and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, and the context of those progressions because there are you know these are transformations so there are changes and we can make these distinctions between these changes um they have more to do with our relationship towards uh well you know the earlier structures have a different qualitative relationship to time and space than the later ones so um there there could be some developmental i guess insights but it's in such a nonlinear way to, that that the the kind of generalizations one could make, let's say, for somebody in the mental structure, um, let's say that they're, they're cutting themselves off. They've they've grown an ego and a development, and we have a sense of space and science. And let's take Newton. You know, um, the world and the consciousness Newton is inhabiting is very different than say somebody from thirty thousand years ago uh, who is sort of living a hunter-gatherer nomadic lifestyle. They have completely different orientations. They have different forms of mastery. The person from 20,000 years ago may understand the movement of the stars in a qualitative way um, that Newton himself, d despite being a master of understanding the new physics, had very little insight into. So there's different forms of intelligence that emerge in the structures and are kind of crystallized and mastered. So they don't necessarily pile on top of each other. And when we're getting into these minute details that I think um, are better explained by the discipline of psychology, I think this is where, you know, lines of development and growth and um, those kinds of questions make more sense. But Gepser didn't really kind of approach those per se. Um, so, yeah, so that I don't, I don't want to get into too many details yet, but that's that's sort of where I would situate things. Like very, very different. He's looking at something very different than um, lines of development. He's not really using that model. And we were talking about morals and ethics. Uh, how is that handled there? Well, um, 
It depends on what we mean by, by morals and ethics. In the magical structure, um, there, there doesn't need to, it's not interpreted as, let's say, what is good or what is right. Perhaps there's some other relationship to morals. Perhaps there's more of an instinctive and intuitive capacity that the, the individual is really part of a group consciousness and a group body that makes up the tribe. And so everybody's sort of attuned to the needs and the dynamics of the tribe. And it's more related to um, the vitalism, the energy, the mana, the numinosum of, of the particular tribe and its relationship to the animals, the animals and the animistic spirits that are in, let's say, the mountain where you live. You have this kind of ecology that a symbiotic ecology you're participating in. In the mental and mythical, then maybe some morals will come in there. Maybe, you know, um, there will be a god who directs your activity that, you know, the mental and the mythical are, are kind of oriented towards directivity, right? Um, maybe your morals will be complementary. Maybe um, good and bad kind of balance each other out in your cosmic understanding because in the mythical, there's that polarity of complementary opposites. So maybe your sense of what's good and bad is a little different. And then in the mental, it, it gets more and more direct and directionality. So maybe there is kind of law and juris jurisprudence, right? Kind of going in a certain way, going literally to the right. What is right? Do we have rights? Um, commandments and edicts that come from on high. And so there's a more of a directionality, you know, and what's proper and appropriate. So it depends. It really depends on where we are. You know, in the mental, I think we start, think, we start thinking in terms of morals and development and those kinds of things. Even the concept of moral development and lines is more of a mental orientation and expression of the mental structure itself. So the question kind of morphs depending on how you're looking at the structure of consciousness that that's in play, you know, in the world. So, and then for us, of course, we have all of these things, you know, all of these things are, are at play in us. Um, and the integral, it's, it's uh, not so much about uh, jurisprudence or, or moving from left to right or, or divine edict, um, but kind of there's a relaxing in the integral. So it's not so much about that. Maybe, maybe it's more about presence and a renunciation of power, which Gepser talks about a little bit. It could be his interpretation, but um, Gepser has a kind of a Taoist ethics, I would say. Um, th there's a passivity, a relaxing, um, a, a kind of a poise that starts to take place, a kind of an openness of the heart and a movement away from kind of the the mythical image of like a god or the law into the sort of openness, a, a reconnectedness with things in which action is sort of not really um, directed by a god or the ego anymore, but we're sort of working with the whole again. So ethics in the integral would be, you know, how do we relate this all back to the whole? How does this sort of participate? Or it's kind of a question of that, like, are we cut off from the whole and from origin? Because then that's the ethical dilemma there. That's sort of the, that's how we act against the nature of things um, or for it or with it. So I don't know, it, I hope that sort of makes sense. Yeah, thank you, it, it made sense to me. Um, thank you, uh, Paul, do you want, you haven't talked yet, do you want to add something? Um. Yeah, I was just, I suppose I was, I was trying to work out like how some things develop um, and sort of the hierarchy thing is quite interesting to me. Like I was looking at, I did a quick Google on like multiple intelligences and stuff. And um, I was thinking of, like Ryan was talking about um, Isaac Newton and I was looking at bodily and kinesthetic and I was just thinking of like my cats that kind of put me to shame when it comes to all this kind of athletic uh, stuff. Um, so I don't know if I have any, <laughs> any sense to say, but I was just thinking like, it'd be really interesting to see how these lines are mapped out. Um, especially the less kind of mental ones, like kind of mathematics and music and uh, spatial, there's one on there, um, naturalists or how you relate to your, your environment and the whole and all this kind of stuff. Um, some reason I think some of the moral stuff probably maps quite, well into spiral dynamics because there's usually a fair amount of morality at each stage 
Um, so yeah, that, I was just kind of musing on the the sort of hierarchy of each line or how it how it might develop. Without, uh, I don't really know that much about it to to say more. Thank you. Uh, for me, uh, maybe because I got you, uh, I got to know you, Jeremy. But I'm beginning to doubt if really everything is a developmental thing, because um, I think that really the moral in in beige would be lower than it is in 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 green or in orange or something. It's you know, I, in some way it doesn't make sense. And to me also the nines are together. There are some people who just are not musical or just have no aesthetic uh, sense of, of why should that be a line they need to develop if they don't have it. I'm more thinking that we have certain categories of gifts with which we come into the world and then we can develop them but that we have all a bunch of all these lines which we need to develop, I don't really know if that makes sense. It's just, you know, it came to me lately that mm, it, it seems like push it into a, into a system, you know, and I do think that integral theory is very an orange construct, you know, it's talking about other things, but it's, uh, if it is built up, it's very orange. So, it has to be in a certain way and everything has to be inside the theory as in every theory, people try to put everything in. And I begin to doubt a little bit. I just throw it in and I wonder what you, what you say to that. I, 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 this reminds me of what you and Jeremy are saying of Patrick uh, Cassidy's presentation. Remember that on the circles? And especially what Jeremy was saying about blue meme, the arising of, of uh, good and bad, you know, the construct, and that's sort of where Patrick put that. And that, that would be kind of the moral distinction at blue. Beige, what he, what he would put a life or death. That's the moral distinction. Is it going to kill me or is it, am I, you know, going to survive? And then after, after good and bad came true and false, I don't remember all his different, you know, is, and that seems to be the orange thing. Is this true? Or, you know, let's examine this. Is this actually true or is this false? But I don't know what it, what, remember what it was at Green and Beyond that he was saying. Do you remember? There was something about the interconnectedness of all things. Is, is, is it whole or part or something like that? Is it the whole picture or is it the, you know, just part of the picture? That was one of the upper ones. I did have that experience of, ex of presenting that to the women in prison and and they, it was strange because they actually didn't get the um, good and bad one, right and wrong. They didn't, they, they couldn't, until I said, but you're in prison. And they went, oh, oh, right. We're, <laughs> we're here because we're bad. <laughs> you know, so it was kind of this interesting, but they did get the ones way at the top, whatever he was saying. I can't remember the model, but. It did seem to go along with sort of moral development or ethical development, what he was talking about. And what I also want to, to, to acknowledge that normally when we think about morals, we think about good and bad, but it might not always be good and bad no? uh, in different situations. Right and wrong or useful or not useful could also be uh, uh, in some way um, the guidelines. I feel like there's a difference in more development of um, internal morals and external morals and that these can take turns as we go through the stages. Um, and so, uh, for example, Blue has, um, is, is known for having a focus on that good and bad moral development and it is very, very external. But at Orange and Green, there's more of an internal development of what is my inner compass for my personal morals rather than how they've been fed to me. And that may be incongruent with uh, society. So he's really um, in orange are at the apex of the sense of individuation, finding out who we really are and differentiating from society. Um, this um, feels really correlated with some of the archetypal development that I've been studying. And I'm wondering if, 
that is something that you're interested in, in hearing. The archetypal development, well, a little bit more context there is that it's um, the development of the ego and the development of the self. That internal um, personal structure versus the like intuitive um, compassion, connective principles of like the greater self that has more of that um, compassion, loving quality to it. So is that something that I should um, share a little bit about here? Yeah, I said go for it. Was the, um, was that like self and like transpersonal or I, I wasn't quite sure on the definition there. Good question. Yeah, exactly. So self is like capital S self, the transpersonal, the, the universal absolute um, that is undifferentiated um, versus the ego, which is differentiated and really about this unique person. I see. The, oh, excuse me. It's also uh, Mark Gaffney uh, has uh, the, um, how was it, the self, the... He has another self in between. Uh, I don't know what that, I cannot see that. Mm -hmm. anyway, oh, is it, it too hard to see? Well, you can see the shapes there. The dark circles are the ego and the gray circles are the transpersonal self. And so on the um, this side over here, are, when we're born, we're in the Ouroboros stage. Um, we're really held by the greater self. Um, through our mother and our environment. We don't have a lot of our own guiding principles. And as we grow, we start to develop more of self that's often introjected from our parents and from our culture. And then that uh, ego self starts to go through stages where uh, we define ourselves as different from our parents and different from our culture. We kind of um, do what we call, uh, what my teacher calls, um, the, we, we start to access the hero archetype and move into a dragon fight where we're deciding um, this is the way that my family structure has been and I am not going to be that way. I am going to choose to develop my career. These are the things that are important to me and um, I'm gonna go in a totally different direction and blaze the trails. Um, and then as we reach like the apex of our career, we start to recognize that there's some things missing in life. We kind of go through that, um, midlife crisis and that midlife crisis can happen at any age, um, depending on, um, how, depending on lots of things. Um, and as that midlife crisis starts to happen, we start to look within ourselves again. Um, another noteworthy thing about the, the circles is, that the, um, the earlier stages has a lot of internal focus. That internal focus is rather compulsive and um, guided by body sensations. So we're really identified with the impulses that are arising in our physical, emotional system. And then um, as the ego starts to leave the transpersonal self and differentiate, um, we're guided by ideas and concepts and the external world, we start to want to have uh, develop mastery and skills. And um, we start to suppress those internal urges and have that external focus. When that reaches the our, an apex, once again, then we start to look within and start to integrate the internal and the external world, those those drives and morals and concepts with our personal experience and basically start doing our shadow work and becoming interested in things like integral and <laughs> whatnot um, until eventually we um, are able to come back into um, unification of our ego with the transpersonal self with a lot more consciousness than there was before. And we're aware of what's in our shadow um, and yet it's still in shadow. We, we still choose to suppress some things, but it's done consciously rather than unconsciously through the, the unification and integration.
you are laying, laying out this eco, sort of eco development. Are you familiar with Susan Kukreuter eco development or uh, Kim Bader and the Terry of Fallon? I yeah, I've been studying uh, with Kim Barta in conjunction with uh, my teacher, who she is how I found Integral. She just published this book. They were worked on it, working on it for like eight years. She and another. Um, the treasure within, and how is your name? Mm -hmm. My teacher is uh, Shannon Pernetti, and then I also work with Diane too a little bit. But mm -hmm. um, they have. Um, they study with Terry O'Fallon and they've studied quite a bit of Integral and um, also with Eric Neumann and Edward Edinger is where that diagram comes from. Um, so there's a lot of overlap and, um, okay, so what's been standing out to me as I've been studying with Kim this week and with Shannon um, is the, um, the value of repression as we individuate and the value of um, actually how those interjects shape our fundamental nature. They shape like the morals that we, we organize around, but what we, what we do have control over. So what we don't have control over is the stuff that's interjected and the the stuff that we come into the world with like our soul dent and our um natural tendencies I, i'm in that class too can you define oh great terms? yeah yeah he has three terms but those are two that he yeah did you want to do that key um so a projection is when um we feel triggered by something happening externally and we blame others for it when really it is something that is true about ourselves. So if there's a discomfort and your finger is pointing externally, it's probably a projection that needs to be re-owned and, and explored. And that projection often contains Interjects and split ego states that are too hard for us to handle without cognitive dissonance. So in order to organize our psyche, we throw it out there and say, you guys deal with it. You're all wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm okay over here. And as we re-own that material, we recognize, oh, it's actually me that's, that's not okay. But that seed didn't necessarily start with us. It was often interjected by our parents. Our parents told us something about the way that we are or how the world is enough times that we've used it as a lens to interpret the world through and ourselves. And that can then be given back to that person specifically, um, healed and reintegrated. Uh, basically, there's often a missed learning lesson that we didn't have enough understanding for how to navigate. Um, and as we, we grow intellectually and emotionally with a lot of self-understanding, we can um, access that mislearning lesson and that interjection can leave our system. Or there's also split ego states, that's the third one, where we feel a sense of confusion, a split around how to navigate one of those challenging situations. And um, either the split ego states need to be integrated or um, one of them can leave the interject can leave we ask it to leave our system. So I feel like part of the um, moral development process with the integral framework is um, absorbing some of those interjections and then deciding what is actually true for us, not allowing them to be unconsciously interjected, but choosing our generative, like the positive qualities about it and letting go of the ways that that interject hasn't served us. The more that we do that, we find our own inner moral compass from the interject seed.
Uh, I basically agree with what you're saying. Uh, but I think that we as human beings know much less about ourselves than we think. And that, um, that there are so many influences uh, which we just don't know. And with all the shadow work we are doing, we're just getting maybe a surface uh, on, on, on things. I think that we basically don't know the water in which we are swimming, like the, the famous example, the fish doesn't know what water is. We are so intrinsically connected <laughs> with our humanness that, that we we have not really a control of, of, of all these aspects. I do agree in many, we can try to get that, you know, but I, I'm sort of doubting that we really get a full control on, on our system, let's say. Um, to me, it's a little bit like, uh, yin yang if I think of going up through the stages it seems to me like we know more about the world but also we know less like the more we realize about the world the more we sort of I think of like string theory or something like this where you know we knew all these kind of Newtonian laws and all this kind of stuff and then suddenly the the bottom just completely um completely melts away and um I was actually thinking of that little diagram on your on your book Natalie of kind of like as the self uh, grows it's sort of I suppose it's not exactly like that diagram but sort of like as you push out into the into the world it's kind of like the uh, the boundaries are pushed out like people often say especially kind of atheists and stuff where they say like there's always the god of the gaps as a kind of um, way of kind of chipping down blue but I think that's always kind of true to an extent there's always like a um, our knowledge is like the outside bubble and then there's the what's beyond it always like grows grows and gets bigger and um, personally, I think it integral need, like it needs that balance of like knowing and unknowing, because um, green's very grounded in like unknowing, which is where it sometimes gets like problematic. Because it's like, you know, what do we do? Nobody knows because there's so much um, ambiguity. So I think there needs to be like um, a balance so that we can we can do stuff without being like closed minded and kind of cut off from the mystery and stuff and or like the potential for more. I, want, I wanted to go back for a second and ask Jeremy a few questions. Um, so I'm gonna open this. <laughs> so just, just to see how this relates to the Gibsonian model and everything, Jeremy, I, I, I wanna ask you some specific questions. So I know that Heidi was saying this morning that she had watched some of the Zizek and Peterson uh, debate. And there's a part in the debate where Zizek goes, where are the Marxists? You know, where are the, are the Marxists? You keep on thinking these are the neo Marxists. Where are the, are the Marxists? And so, my question uh, that was a horrible Slovenian accent, but uh, my, my question to you, Jeremy, is like, in terms of the Gebserian integral model, can you name a few prominent public intellectuals, spiritual teachers, maybe people that we all know who you think are evincing, demonstrating an integral consciousness in Gebser's framework? Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, great. I, I liked your sniff right there. That was perfect. That was, <laughs> yeah, that was a great touch there. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, like, okay, so in his own time, Gebser very clearly understood Sri Aurobindo and Tehar de Chardin as, as two luminous individuals. He actually saw Aurobindo's work as, um, he hypothesized later on in his life that his insight in the 1930s was somehow an emanation or a transmission from Aurobindo. And he wasn't being like, you know, dead on, this is what happened, but he was so spiritually moved by Aurobindo's work that he was like, this guy's got it. Um, so, so, you know, that I think he was very egalitarian in terms of like what he saw integral consciousness being. He was very interested in, let's say like DT Suzuki. Um, and I think we should make some distinctions because what an integral individual can be 
um, there's almost kind of layers to this or, or um, uh, different phases or, or, or potentialities because on the one hand, like, you know, I think you and I were talking about this. It could be, you know, just a cultural manifestation like Picasso. Like Picasso was, he expressed temporics in his art. And so there was this aperspectival dimensionality. But is Picasso the same as Aurobindo? You know, like there's, there's, there's a world of difference. And I think that's where the, this conversation is, is sort of taking place. What are those differences and, and how do we distinguish? So um, in the more profound refinements of what it means to be an integral individual, um, Gepser talks about how spatiality is sort of replaced by temporicity or the emphasis on temporicity and time and understanding what time actually is, which isn't spatiality, which isn't quantifiable clock time. It isn't lines of development. It isn't stages. Time has a kind of an energy and a dimensionality that requires its own language and concepts that most people don't use and is only kind of being explored in process philosophy and artwork, et cetera. So, that's a precondition. But then on the other hand, like this openness to time creates this diaphaneity of time the kind of the wholeness. And it's in that sort of refinement of presence of time, right? And the presence of temporal consciousness that the spiritual dimension can begin to crystallize. And so I think that's why he was saying, you know, in, in its more refined state, the a perspectival and the integral can become a spiritual expression and it's expressed in the contemplatives and the mystics and the saints and so on um, who, who express this more acutely, like let's say DT Suzuki or Sri Aurobindo or Tehard and his like um, sort of evolutionary Christianity and things like that. So, so that would be, where are the, where are the Marxists? Where are the postmodern neo-Marxists of, of, I don't even know how this relates, but um. Uh, in terms of the contemporary world, I mean, I would certainly say at, at, at a less refined level, it's, the a perspectival is everywhere, you know, from Whitehead and process philosophy to Gregory Bateson and what he was talking about with how to think about cognitive, cognitive thinking itself and systems to William Irwin Thompson, you know, and what he was doing or what is he is doing with Ralph um, Abraham in chaos dynamics and mathematics and sort of looking at complex systems. So, Anybody who's moving kind of beyond uh, a developmental linear approach and who's playing with complex nonlinear systems, not only abstractly, but also kind of applying them to their work, you know, I think they're expressing temporics in a way that is sort of a perspectival. And then um, I would just name, name a, th a few people out there. Uh, I love what Tim Morton is doing with ecology. And he, he wrote this beautiful little book called Being Ecological, which is just a wonderful text that um, is related to what Gepser is talking about with a perspectivity, um, his concept of the hyper object and ecology and sort of the entanglement and enmeshment of human beings with the non-human world. Like that, that's a very a perspectival concept. So I would say it's kind of everywhere. It's sort of, it's manifesting everywhere. It's McLuhan's work. It's McLuhan's work on electronic culture and simultaneity and moving beyond causal process. Um, I don't know. It's hard to explain because for, for, for Gepser, again, he's looking at like our, our inherited phenomenology, um, which are these deep, deep processes and orientations and structures, which aren't looking necessarily at like the particular embattlements and entrenchments of the culture war. But he would be like, well, why is there a culture war? Like, why, why is everybody divided up? There's actually a structure of consciousness in that superstructure in a way, you know, so we're in it. We're in it, man. We're, we're in the kind of interim world between the perspectival and the aperspectival, and it's kind of showing up everywhere. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's sort of my initial. <laughs> we're the cultural postmodern neo-Marxists. They're, they're everywhere, man. Um, so yeah, so uh, aperspectively themed art and science, etc. And I would throw Morton out there. Um, I love what Maria Popova is doing, just to sort of like She's great. She's talking about um, combinatorial creativity, simultaneity. Um, her new book, Figuring, is the sort of poetic kind of rendering of across time and space of these like little tiny things and these big concepts and scientists and poets and artists. So I think she's exemplifying the work. Um, I think it's popping up. You can find the stylism very abundantly, I guess I would say. So 
Can I ask a question to Jeremy as well? And maybe this is mm -hmm. a question you want you don't want to answer, and that's fine. What is your what is your response to you know the I am guy? What's his name? Dave. You know that wants to throw out Orbindo and all of that. David Long. David Long. Oh, David Long. Um, I, I don't really know him too well, uh, but um it it seems like he's just sort of more on the materialist end of things and um, that just doesn't really interest me and those those kinds of battles about you know you know wilbur's rejecting evolution he's a, you know like uh, frank visser's doing the same thing about like taking shots at sheldrake and it, to me like the, those people kind of they, they don't they don't have something they don't have this kind of nuanced openness to this thing, you know, it's a non-materialist viewpoint. So they won't ever, it won't ever even be able to see it, you know? So I'm much more interested in the people who are exploring those questions, but are kind of in the, in the middle zone, like Jeffrey Kripal's work. Um, Jeffrey Kripal is looking at some of the same topics. Uh, he, he just came out with a book about scientists who have paranormal and religious experiences and experience the flip. It's called the flip. So I'm very interested in, in that, intermediary space and to come down really hard and go like, ah, we just need to fully embrace materialism and get everybody on board and get rid of all these mystical evolutionary folks who are just fluffing it. No, no, I, I, I think, I think that's a load of crap and it's not interesting. It's not intellectually interesting um, either. So, I, but it's fine. You know, people have, some people have that disposition, but to me, it's the same kind of thing that you see in the culture wars with like the new atheists kind of going after uh, uh, the Christian communities. And they're all having these debates about like what reality is and meta. Uh, I don't know. I'm, it just doesn't interest me as a, as a, Although to me, was, that's not where the interesting questions are. There was that one guy that um, was on some thread. I can't even remember. And he was kind of going at everybody pretty heavily. And I know that last week you got some kudos for being the one guy who's hung in and actually brought the guy around to some expressing some heartfelt stuff about himself. And then it kind of flipped the whole thing for me when he actually expressed what was going on for him. I can't even remember the thread went on for like, you know, forever. And you kept, you hung yeah. in with the guy, you know. Was that, was that the, I mean, I don't know. I was involved in a couple of those lately. I've been trying not to, but it's kind of hard sometimes. And you, yeah. You hung in with him. And he was, you know, he was um, arguing against everything kind of integral. He was going crazy, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've, I've, it's interesting. I, I don't want to hog the conversation, but, but, uh, um, that I think was at the intersection of like, oh, you know, Wilbur's embracing the intellectual dark web and 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 let's reject all of integral and then there's other people who are like coming on down hard and rejecting green completely and 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 i'm just sort of like in the middle there trying to go like no this is this is silly both like let's get clearer about this um so i don't know i i tend to not be combative in these threads and just try to be patient <laughs> sometimes it works but it's not easy <laughs> but um Ryan, did you have another note besides that one about the, the Zizek question? Well, um, just really quickly, Jeremy, did you see Avengers Endgame yet? No, no, I'm seeing it tonight. <laughs> oh, nice. So, so when you do, I'd like to hear, my, my opinion was this is an example of integral and mainstream. And I think that en Avengers Endgame was probably one of the most integral movies I've ever seen in my life. Um, I won't spoil it. <laughs> so let's talk about it when you, after you see it. But uh, okay. but anyway, um, but I guess my question to you, just just to get a sense of, just to kind of bring this conversation together too, like where do you stand? Uh, so this is a two-part question. So the first one is, where do you stand in terms of, are you a Gebserian or are you a Wilburian? And what aspects of Wilbur's model do you integrate with Gebser, if at all? And in terms, mm -hmm. the second question is, in terms of moral development, if someone is experiencing integral in the way Gebser described as diaphanous where the present is now and all of these kind of, you know, time is experienced in this way. Is it then pretty much impossible to become a serial murderer, psychopath, rapist, uh, dictator kind of a person or, or because mm. would, would having that consciousness automatically disqualify you from lower, lower levels of moral action or are you still susceptible to 
doing crazy things because it's just a phenomenological experience, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would say in its more refined state, the act of, of I don't know, do, the examples you gave um, in the integral structure, it'd be hard to do that. But but again, I think there's there's a tremendous, it's like a plateau. It's like this new world, we're already living in it, everything's getting restructured, and then the individual has an impetus or an invitation to, to truly substantiate that new world in themselves and trace back what created that, which is this, the spiritual, which is origin. And that refinement process is, it, Aurobindo speaks better to it in terms of when he talks about, and this, this actually applies to what we were talking about earlier about um, moral development, where he has, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, the intermediate or intermediary zone guru. Have you guys heard of that? Um, well, it, it's a sort of process where, um, and, and I appreciate it because we don't have enough of these because in, in many uh, of our kind of developmental models, it's, it, we don't think about the in-between. You know, um, this is the, the common problem that philosophers always debate about, like, okay, when does this object become another object? At what, at what segment in the line of changes does it? So right in this in-between, you know, we're getting this sort of spiritual insight or, or, or these divination processes happening, enlightened states are happening. Um, why can a person who's experiencing those things still do bad things? Um, and, and Aurobindo talks about this intermediary zone guru, which is basically where the, the divine is sort of entering us and sublimating and divinizing and, and alchemizing, however you want to say it. There's a transformative process at work. But in that intermediary space, the ego is also getting divinely inflated. And so it, things are not purified or rarefied enough. It takes a lot of work. And even then, I don't think there's ever kind of like a final point where it's like, I, I will never do bad again. So... It, these are kind of even existential questions about how, do, how does one truly be good and sort of, in a, can saints do evil things, you know? Maybe they still can too. Maybe their personality is not quite perfected or in, in, a, in a rarefied way. So I think this question of can we do, will evil continue to persist? Will, will, will bad acts continue to persist? Probably, even the, in the integral. Maybe it will be a little bit more refined. Maybe we'll be a little bit less prone to manifest those things in it in as a acutely explicit way, you know, maybe it'll be a little bit more sublimated, maybe, but I, I think it doesn't completely go away. Um, maybe in, at the end of the universe when everything's redeemed or something, in some eschatological view. But uh, I think the problem of evil and the kind of the imperfectedness of the cosmos, um, that state of tension is sort of what is, what is, engendering the creative processes, the, these sort of cosmotheandric processes that we're interested in here as, as evolutionary spiritual folks. But um, so, yeah, and then in terms of Wilbur Gebser, um, I, I would say I'm most, I, I wouldn't want to say I'm a Gebserian, like Jung, like hate Jungians, right? Um, he, he doesn't want people to become Jungians. And I, I feel like Gebser would probably feel the same way but in terms of my orientation, yeah, I think I, I have some primary influences and Gebser is definitely one of the center ones. Uh, Wilbur is not, but he was, an op he was a doorway to a lot of these thinkers for me. So he has more of a kind of a biographical center for me, like reading him and then finding all of these writers that we talked about. So um, I don't really incorporate a lot of what he says into the work because it's so developmentally focused and it's become even more developmentally, developmentally focused in his later years. Um, I do really appreciate uh, Wilbur's 1980s work, like the Ottman Project and Up From Eden. And I think there was more room for nuance and the kind of ambiguity um, that is not as strictly developmental in that Wilbur phase. I forget which one that is, three, two, I, I, I don't know. Um, but. I would recommend actually a really good paper for you guys that is more integral oriented in his language. It's uh, Chris Durkey's, I can share it with you, uh, Searching for Centaur. And he talks about this, the studying the Wilbur phases and kind of a critique of the later Wilbur and an appreciation for this middle Wilbur. Um, so I, I'd love to share that with you guys because I think it speaks to some of the, the criticisms that I, that I have as well. So. Can somebody share all this, all these people that he named, that you named Jeremy in a group email? 
or something? Um, like sure. I don't I don't even remember who I just, but I'll, I remember the Chris Durkis thing. Uh, you mentioned Avengers. Uh, I think I mentioned Tim Morton. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Jeff Vandermeer too, actually. Now, speaking of uh, art, uh, a perspectival integral of art, Jeff yeah. Vandermeer is, is fantastic. Yeah. Maybe what I can do is while I'm taking notes, Jeremy, I can uh, probably butcher the spelling of some of the names, send a draft over to you, and you can edit them up so you don't have to oh, go back. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate yeah. that. That would be very good because so we have an access to it. Otherwise, I often don't even know how to write these people when I don't know them. So even if I have understood right, I don't know. So anyway, we, we have still 20 minutes and I find it very interesting, Jeremy, thank you for, for that. Uh, I don't feel I can add a lot. Only about uh, in the afternoon, I watched um, a video, I should, I should look for it, where uh, a person says that reality uh, you, you, you is, um, how can you say, you can predict uh, reality with a mathematical construct. So he says, in, uh, normally you think, um, oh no, I cannot get that. Anyway, that uh, a, a sort of ma mathematical um, proof that consciousness is at the bottom of everything and material comes much later, while uh, nowadays is still everybody thinks the material is uh, at the bottom of everything and maybe then there comes consciousness out of some part of the, the brain or something like that. I can share that with you. I found it quite interesting too, uh, how he explained that. I think he, he is called Hoffman. Hoffman. I, I can look it up just a moment. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think that that's a really good distinction. I don't have a lot to say about that, but... Um... It's interesting that right now in the humanities, panpsychism is becoming increasingly popular from previous, previously materialist oriented philosophers. And I'm just getting a, a kick out of that. It seems to be a figure ground reversal going on right now in, in, in a lot of Western philosophy, so. I, can you define panpsychism? And psychism is, is uh, mind is in everything. You know, mind is behind everything. I don't know if anyone has a better definition, but essentially, you know, matter, mind is intrinsic to all matter so that it's possible in this theory, like a sun could have self-consciousness, like a star, uh, a rock. There's an like interiority to the cosmos, like Tehard called it. Uh, there is a within of things. Of course, he wouldn't exactly say he's a panpsychist since he's a uh, a Catholic uh, theologian. He's more oriented towards transcendent. But anyway, so yeah, mind is inherent to things. That, that's also basic Buddhism. I mean, that has been around for, most, you know, the mind. And, and it really, <laughs> yeah, I mean, most pre-modern traditions had some form of it. Um, a question that I have for the group is, uh, how do we express our moral experience from that place of so much aperspectivalism? Um, it, it feels a lot like it's based, our, our moral is based on what's the good for the moment and the context that we're working with. Um, and there's also so much complexity that we're coming from, so many things that we're drawing from that to be able to name a moral perspective in a concise way can be um, either lengthy or um, inaccurate <laughs> on the two ends of that spectrum. If we get simple enough that it's like, this is my moral stance, it's inaccurate. And um, so how to, like, I guess part of my question is, how do we share our moral perspective with all that complexity and perspectivism with people who are looking for something very simple to navigate life with, um, to decrease the, the complexity of our uh, verbal interactions. I, I don't have an answer to that, but I just wanna say that's a great question. And, and that's sort of, um, uh, Ryan asked like what the difference is with Wilbur and Gebser in terms of how like their, their approaches. 
um, Gepster's always asking this, and it's something I, I try to ask myself too, like, how, what is the new form of statement? How do we say things with this new understanding? And, and yes, you could build a giant complex uh, precursor to like, okay, here's, how, here's our understanding of how the world works and it's really complicated and we get it because we're all used to this language. Um, but then like, okay, well, how do we speak to our, our parents and friends and how do we live that? You know, how, what is the new form of expression? poetic, scientific, et cetera, and how do we bring it into the world? And that's always my question too, for like, how do we translate the concept into expression? I feel like another way to say that is how can our moral self be received by lots of different types of people? And I want to add to that, um, how can we make sure that when we feel that we have a certain level of development and our morals is right, you know, that our language and our way of how we see the morals is not abused by people who are using it, but from a completely different um, perspective, you know, like um, it has often been in the past, probably at the moment too, that green language uh, is used by red people to make, um, to, to, make people feel guilty, green people uh, guilty, you know, when they uh, um, blame them for not doing what they say normally. But I don't know if you understand what I mean. Yeah, Heidi, that's actually the, the thing that I was up all night about is um, when I feel like when I share my, my moral perspective, people uh, get when I share it in, in enough nuance to be understood, they get really angry that um, I'm not making enough sense to them and it, it turns into, into a conflict and it's, it's uh, painful all around. I just wanted to say to Natalie too, I'd be happy to talk to you about this sometime if you wanted to just kind of discuss it after or later today or another day or something. Um, yesterday I was at a workshop all day called, with an organization called Better Angels and they do basically, they hire, they train moderators to facilitate conversations between liberals and conservatives. So we had seven Republicans and seven Democrats in the same room for eight hours doing exercises, relationship building, perspective taking, all kind of stuff. I was just an observer for the event to see if I'm going to get trained as a moderator to do that, which I decided I am going to get trained to do that. And so this was obviously a very hot topic for me yesterday. And, and seeing really seeing i mean I, I hate to say this but really seeing people's inability to take another perspective or feel what another person feels and i was really trying not to get frustrated and just understanding that this is why people are here so it's it's great that they even showed up to even try this it's, but the the inability to really um understand anyone else's value system or emotions toward a certain thing and was really kind of frustrating for me and given how much passion i have around doing that myself and for me, I really wish I was a participant. Uh, and it was really hard for me to be an observer because I feel like part of the, the key to communicating your, your values or your moral stances effectively is how you frame it. And so if you frame it in a way in which the other person, other, the other party with a very different worldview can understand it, you may have different ways of getting to the top of the mountain but as long as you, you, if you frame it in the right way where you highlight that the goal is the same or even the underlying values are the same, it's just a different, different approach, different way of the how is different than the what, then I think it can be very effective. And I've seen several politicians do this very well and, and how you frame certain issues to, to win voters. Um, and so I think part of that is understanding where the other people are coming from and then how do you frame your issue so that they, they can resonate with it and get on board instead of this is my world fighting against your world. And I think the integral perspective is even to start with their world and to add to it and then try to, try to create a confluency between their world and your world. And, and um, this is something I'm trying to develop. And, and again, I'll, we can talk more about this uh, later. Yeah, that is perfect. And I think we should do also, apart from the uh, nonviolent communication trainings group, we should do that too. Uh, train to speak in other in other levels uh, language let's say how to how to 
enter into the world of the other without feeling strange, you know, because before when you were green and you needed to talk in blue, you felt, oh no, that's not me. It's, it's a, like a betrayal, you know, of your own uh, level of development. So how to do that? I would, I would love if we could do some exercises to that. Brian, if you get uh, maybe some questions for that, and then we can do even on the, on the Thursday groups when we have nothing to debate, we could do some of, of this exercise. I would really appreciate that. That's something that I'm very interested in. Um, I've found through my life that communication of my cognitive understanding and my emotional understanding and complexity um, can is has been a really, really challenging thing. It's a piece of inherited karma for me. My parents are very, very poor communicators. And so there's a huge gap um, sometimes between that understanding and my ability to frame it in a way that's going to land appropriately. So I, I study all of these things, but um, the, the skill and mastery that um, I'd like to develop is still much, much wanting. This, this context for it feels really, really um, pertinent right now. So in the, all the time I've worked with NBC and with different people from different value systems, I, I have, I've noticed that there, it's like you said, Ryan, it's just it's a choice of words sometimes. Like I, I've noticed, in, for example, the abortion topic, it's what, what I watch is like, where are people going to have a, like a visceral reaction to, to what somebody's saying? And the word choice is where, it, people, I mean, they don't do it that dramatically, but there is a, there's a reaction to that idea, the nuance of what choice actually means when they don't, that's, that was like a key point. Like, can we, is there another way to talk about, and, and, and you know, then the left is this whole big, huge agenda that it's a women's choice, it's a women's choice, 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 it's even called choice. And then the right, you know, the word is just seems so off point, you know, to what they're feeling about babies, you know? So it just, it's just, it's just these little, and I, and I often go in prisons when I'm doing the communication unit and said, how many of you are in here because of a sentence? that somebody said, and so many people raised their hands. It's just something somebody said that, you know, caused them to do something that was pretty bad to end up in prison, you know, a sentence. So it's very powerful, you know, language. Um, yeah, I want to, oh, sorry. I just wanted to speak to that uh, for a moment because, um, when you are mentioning abortion as, as a topic and then choice, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's a, I think for the integral person, and I've been thinking about this too, because, you know, um, with my studies with Gepser and, 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 um, these guys are really brilliant, really intelligent, but since there hasn't been too much application in like Gepser's work or McLuhan's work for like, because these, they've been, you know, more in the academic uh, uh, schools of thinking, and, and we haven't been creating little think tanks or, or um, I don't know, just applied places where we're doing this work in the world. You know, it, Gepser's work has really kind of only kind of become revived recently with like my book's publication, and then the Gepser Society has been kind of a little container. So I've been thinking about ways how how do I how do I do this work because you know being involved in the integral theory world and the Ken Wilber world, a lot of people are out there trying to do this work, you know, trying to apply it. So it's a really important question, but immediately, you know, when you're saying that, I, I was thinking um, there might be, you know, an, a different attunement to, to the body and the energy of the body and what is a body, you know, the body isn't just matter that we're making decisions about, you know, in that, insight and that form of consciousness, you know, there's, there's not only just a value to the body, but there's a kind of a life force. There's a mana, there's a, there's, um, there's an energy body, you know, that the, it's sort of like the Catholic view of the sacraments. It's not just bread. It's the, it's the body of Christ. You, you treat it respect, you know, so there's this energy to these things and the way people are experiencing what, what the world is that as integralists, if we, Part, I think part of the, the, the work is really attuning ourselves um, in a nonverbal way first or, or, or moving beyond the, the language 
to get how the language is actually coming from these structures, you know, or these, these forms of consciousness. And it, we really have to like somehow internalize that in ourselves. And at least what I get from Gepser's approach to integral is that you're able to, um, Natalie, you were mentioning this before, I think in a way, uh, something similar to what Gepser was saying, uh, you, you retract these structures back into yourself and, and you truly, not in a kind of a waking ego way, but super consciously understand their nature and their being and their, their world relation. And you've brought that in yourself and you see it at work in yourself. So when another person is coming from some other view, that's your view. You have that. You, that's part of your body. It, you've actually kind of incorporated, literally incorporate. You've incorporated them already into your being. And so you can speak to them with that part of your being that is them. And that sounds like very difficult work, but I feel like this sort of is the, the, the underlying, the baseline that an integral practitioner has to relate to the rest of the world with, or else it's so confusing. How do I speak to a Trump voter? How do I speak to, you know, the build a wall person? Um, we have to somehow be able to, to get out of ourselves into the mirror and see the mirror as, as a reflection of ourselves. And I, I'm not, I don't really know how to do that exactly, but I think certainly psychology is a discipline in a field and our, our teachers are, are very trained in that way. So anyway. I find that very important what you say, Jeremy, and I also see the limitation of the Wilbur model in that, because when this, this as I understood it at the beginning, and many people still understand it, that the levels of development is better, you are higher. You know, and so when you are high up there, you don't want to look down and go, get into this lower level again. And I think that's, um, that's counterproductive, even if it may be not be meant in this way, but it's, it's impl impl implicit somehow in this, in this model. I see it with so many people that they think they're better because they are now in integral and with these lower levels, uh, and I see it in myself too. So, uh, so maybe an approach which is not so much thinking in hierarchies, maybe it's a, it's a better way to for us to enable us to to re reconnect with the previous, not with the lower levels, but maybe with the previous levels would be already a better word in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. J Jeremy, just to go back to what you were saying really quickly, how do you talk to the build the wall person? I got to, again, give a plug to my boy, Andrew Yang, running for president in 2020. And I've learned more about integral from Andrew Yang than I have learned from Ken Wilber. The way that he talks to people. So this is what he would say to the guy. He has two phrases that, that I'm going to start to use. And I'll share them here so people can practice it. So if the guy says, well, Andrew, what do you think about building a wall? There are two phrases that he has. The first one is, well, what, what is your underlying goal, interest, or intention in wanting to build a wall? Oh, to protect American jobs, oh, to secure the border, oh, to have, because I'm proud to be an American. So this is, this is the phrase he says, I'm all for the spirit of it, but I, but I differ on the exact approach and how, on, on how to achieve your goals. So the phrase, I'm all for the spirit of it. The other phrase he uses is, we're very philosophically aligned, but I may have a different approach on how to get there. Or, or I'm all aligned with your goal. Now, if it's really a bad thing, like if someone said, Andrew Yang, what do you think about Hitler? He won't say, I'm all for the spirit of the Nazis, right? He won't say, I'm all for the spirit of Stalin. He'll say, he, he'll say, because a lot of people try to get him to attack Trump and he wasn't attack Trump. He says, attacking Trump is a waste of time because Trump is a symptom of a deeper underlying societal imbalance. So he says, go for the deeper imbalance and not the symptom. And that's what he's trying to fix as president. And so to me, those two conversation skills, it's like, that's all I needed to connect with anyone. Whatever they say, I just, what is your underlying goal, purpose, intention, need, concern? And I'm all for the spirit and I resonate with that. We just may have slightly different ways of getting to ways to address that. And if it's really bad, you just say, um, let's, I think that's a symptom and, and let's go deeper to what created the symptom. I really like what you were saying, Jeremy. Yeah, I love Andrew Yang too. And I really like what you were saying, Jeremy, about the, the body you know, about being able to take it in. And I think this whole movement toward embodiment and everybody talking about it is really a, an advance, you know, for certain ways that I've been able to, like on the abortion issue, I've been able to 
see the other point of view and have the other complete different perspective because of an embodiment experience that I had related to it. Like, oh, I suddenly feel what that feels like, you know? And I, and I, and I can share your opinion, your view, and I can also share the other view, you know? So it's, but it came from this bodily experience. Um, I'm wanting to note that we're approaching 10.30 now and I'm wondering if we want to start some closeouts, check-in or check-outs. This has been a really rich conversation. Thank you, everybody. I would say I have to go to another meeting right now, but thank you so much, everyone. And um, this has been awesome. So aloha. Take care. We'll talk about Avengers soon. <laughs> awesome. What kind of forever? I also need to duck out. Um, and so some of the things that, that stood out was what uh, Ryan was saying just now um, about Andrew Yang sharing that I'm all for the spirit of it as a way to connect but then take conversation in a different direction that's more relevant for us. Um, yeah, there's a number of other things that stood out, but um, thank you everybody. We'll, we'll leave that for future conversations. Yeah, I really appreciate this, another great conversation. I think I like that. I'm all for the spirit of it. Diane Hamilton says it, says what, you know, she talks about sameness and difference a lot. And she says, always find somewhere and somebody that where you're for them. And if you can talk to that for them place and you'll be able to find it, even if you just visualize them as a baby, you know, you'll find it and then talk to that. So I, I like that. Uh, just want to resonate I'm pretty much in an agreement and, and synergy with what everyone's saying uh, are appealing to our humanity, our own wholeness. You know, it's like, it's like giving the other person not only a benefit of the doubt, but what I'm hearing from everybody is, is, you know, as I may have all the capacity to reflect the other, the other has a capacity to reflect me, you know, treat people like, the wholeness of the humanity that they are and, and see, see their reactivity or partiality as, well, this is a symptom of something deeper, like, like Ryan was saying. So I re that really resonates with me and just appreciating this conversation. Paul, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, I was just thinking, I suppose on the, the thing of embodiment and like the intellect, like I, um, I guess I so often think of the spiral or now like with this conversation with the, the whole thing of lines, like where it gets even more complex, like, um, um, I guess the core felt like a, a little bit of both, like kind of feeling into specific examples of stuff, but also to me, I think like having the intellectual clarity to be like, okay, where is somebody at, um, sort of feel it and to be able to think it, I think is, um, um, I don't know, like, for me, the th I found in my, my own journey, like the more integral I become, the more I become more embodied, but I also, it becomes easier for me to uh, map somebody out or map the world out. Like, oh, this is this, this is that. Um, that doesn't feel like a kind of brutal hierarchy. If anything, it feels like compassion, because that's, if I'm, if I'm sort of accurate, then that's actually where they're at. So I think this, I guess this conversation just felt like, again, it was like more embodiment and also kind of appreciating how, uh, how complex we all are. Um, we in the sense of like, you know, the wider humanity and all that kind of stuff and how much uh, integral has to say on it. Okay, last not least me. I, yeah, I agree that uh, the more you, you develop yourself, you can feel into the other person. And I have the experience that I can understand them. But I still think sometimes I, I need to decide not to want to be in company with people who I can understand, but I have to, to draw boundaries because it's, it's too hard to, to be with them, especially when it's near in personal contact. And I had an experience uh, lately about that. So... I finally am able to say no. 
often a little bit too late. Anyway, it was a good conversation and I thank you very, very much. And Jeremy, I saw that you have this sort of course, which I didn't know. I would really love to, 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 to go back and see uh, more of uh, what you did. And I love the work and the, your wisdom, which you bring into the, 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 the round. It's, uh, yeah, something to learn and to grow. Thank you, everybody. And we see Thursday or Sunday next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.